Hello and welcome to the Easter services of the Franklin Baptist Church. As many of our members already know, we're going to be having a special service here at the church on Easter Sunday. We'll be meeting in our cars in the parking lot uh, here at the church. And it'll give us a chance as a church family to be together on the Lord's Day and on Resurrection Sunday. But for those of you that could not make it, I wanted to go on ahead and bring a special Easter message to you at home today. I don't want you to miss out on the preaching of God's Word. I don't want you to miss out on the importance of Easter Sunday. And so that's what I want to do here at this time is bring you a message about Jesus Christ. And of course, Easter is all about Jesus. Uh, Sundays are the Lord's Day. It's the day that we celebrate His resurrection every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But of course, Easter is that special time where we turn our attention and focus on to Christ. And I know many of us, even as Christians, we have our own personal perspectives and views of what Christ did that was of greatest value, what was most important. I know all of us probably have our favorite things that Jesus did that relate to us personally. And, and I understand that each of us probably would even um, uh, like to tout our own personal opinions about what is most valuable about Christ's ministry. And we can go down the list. We can start there on that uh, first Christmas when Jesus Christ, God, was born in a human body. God became flesh. God became man. And we think about that wonderful gift. What a valuable gift that is where God came down and became human and became a human life here on this earth and humbled himself in that form. For many, that is the favorite act of Jesus Christ. I know for many, uh, we'll look down through his earthly ministry, beginning with his baptism, and we'll think that is something that is so valuable and so important. You know, there are not a lot of things that Jesus did that you and I can do. But Jesus Christ was baptized. He was immersed and he came back up out of that water. And you and I can be baptized like Jesus was and follow his example as the Bible commands us. Not, of course, to save us from our sins. Jesus did not need to be saved from sin. Neither does baptism wash away our sins. But it's a picture of that death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And I'll tell you what, tell you what that, that gift of baptism, that opportunity to be baptized, the fact that Jesus was baptized, and we have the opportunity to follow that, that's one of those favorite things I think many of us look at. And we can go down, we can look at His teaching, we can look at His miracles, we, we can look at, at His relationship with His disciples. We say, how valuable, and what a precious gift those things were and how great it is that, and how we can relate to those things. We can look there in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus with his heavy burden about to go to Calvary's cross and he sweat as it were great drops of blood the Bible tells us that as he prayed there to God the Father and he surrendered his will to God's will. Nevertheless Jesus said not my will but thine be done. He prayed for God's will to be accomplished there. I think, boy, that's a tremendous, important moment. And of course, I think many of us would look to Calvary's cross. We look to that time where Jesus Christ hung on that cross. He shed his blood and he died sacrificially for you and for me. And we might make the argument that that is the most valuable, the most important thing that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. But I want to give you a different perspective today. And I want to show you what was actually the most important thing that we find about Jesus Christ in the entire Bible. And it, I say it's the most important, not maybe because it's the most dramatic. Uh, maybe we don't, you and I may not always feel and appreciate it personally. But it is the most important thing because without it, none of the other things preceding this have any value. It is the fact that Jesus Christ, although he lived a perfect life, and although he was um, uh, a great teacher and an instructor, and even though he, he did many miracles and helped many people, even though he, uh, he died sacrificially for you and for me, all of those things are tremendous. All of those things are wonderful. But all of those things are meaningless if he does not rise from the grave on that third day. All of those things hold no value without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you would, please, we're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter number 28. And let's begin by looking at the first eight verses in Matthew, chapter number 28. 
The Bible tells us in Matthew 28 and verse number 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. Here is the greatest thing about Jesus, the greatest ministry that he did, the greatest uh, possible gift that he could give. We find it recorded for us here in Matthew chapter number 28 and in all the Gospels. And what's so interesting about the greatest thing Jesus did, He wasn't even there. He wasn't present. It was His absence here from this tomb where He was supposed to be. It was His absence from the tomb that shows us the great value, the great impact. What a wonderful thing it is that we have. And He wasn't even there. This is the greatest moment, the greatest act, the greatest ministry of Jesus. The fact that even though he was dead, even though he laid in that grave for three days, on that first Sunday morning following his crucifixion, that grave was empty. That tomb was empty. And the angel told those ladies, come see the place where the Lord lay. I want you to come and look at what is not here, he said. I want you to see the emptiness of this tomb. And I'll tell you something today, folks. It is the empty tomb where we can find something great. It is the emptiness of that tomb that holds great value. And Mary and these other ladies, they found something great. When they left that tomb, they left, it says, with fear and trembling and great joy. They left that tomb with fear and great joy. They left changed. They left different. When they walked away from that tomb, they were not the same as they were when they approached that tomb. The emptiness of that tomb changed them and brought them something great. It brought them fear and it brought them great joy. There's two things that we find here that they find in this tomb that we can find in this empty tomb today. The greatest ministry, the greatest act, the greatest thing Jesus did in the resurrection, the emptiness of that tomb. It shows us two things today. Very simply, I want to share these with you this morning. The first one is this. The emptiness of that tomb is the proof of the power of God. It is the proof of the power of God. You say, what is power? And, uh, and, and how valuable is power? How long will power last? And is this power still of any value to us today? The truth of the matter is, is that time takes its toll. Uh, everyone and everything eventually dies. And you can look and you can try to measure power historically. You can try to measure power and, uh, and, and, and what has been powerful in the past. You look some 2,500 years ago, the nation of Greece conquered the known world. And, and of course, the, we know Alexander the Great, he wept because there was no more worlds to conquer. And, and he'd conquered all that he could conquer. And he wept there. And, and, and you think about the great power and influence that Greece had. And not just militarily, but you think about culturally. You think about the language. That, 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 that became a common language around the world and everybody spoke and wrote in the Greek language and in Jesus' day that, that was a common tongue the impact, the power of Greece in that day today Greece as a nation has little or no power economically they struggle militarily they are non-existent and you think even about the cultural impact you know even that has become a joke and now when we don't understand something we say that's Greek to me when at one time Greek was the language that everybody spoke and now it's used as a joke about not being able to understand things power dissipates it disappears it dies off 
You can go back even more recently, go back and look at France. A little over 200 years ago, Napoleon's armies marched across Europe. They were the world power. They conquered all of, your, all of mainland Europe. They conquered all of it. That power, that might, and now that military might is now a joke. What do we think of when we think of France militarily? We joke about how they surrender. We talk about how they have no military might, how they have no military power. That power is gone, and it's now a joke. In the United States, just a few short months ago, economically, we were at our peak. We were seeing dominance economically, power economically, and now a virus has crippled our economy. That power is gone. It's gone so fast. Can I tell you something? Any power that you might have, it's going to disappear as well. Any power or strength that you might have, whether it be physical or mental or emotional, the power that you have, it will not last. Time takes its toll. Everything dies. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. But here's the thing. The proof, the power, the proof of the power of God is evident in the tomb because this is the thing that he conquers. He conquers what conquers everything else. He conquers death. That time and that death that destroys all power, Jesus Christ conquered and defeated that in that empty tomb. The empty tomb proves the power of God because in that tomb, death was defeated. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, and what a great chapter this is on, on discussing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in verses 20 through 22, the Bible says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Because Jesus Christ conquered death. He conquered the defeater of everything. He conquered death. And, 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 and in a human form, he conquers death. So too we as human beings, we can overcome and defeat defeat death. This power has not dissipated. This power has not disappeared. This power has not died off. In, in, in the empty tomb, death was defeated. Christ overcame the grave, and now we have hope of life. We have this victory. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57, the Bible says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory today over death. You think about that power, that victory that Jesus Christ, His power overcomes death. It overcomes the grave. It conquers that. And that victory, it carries on through us. You see, the power of God through Jesus Christ and that resurrection of the dead, the defeat of death, that same power is yours and mine through Jesus Christ. This is true power that lasts, that endures. It doesn't fade. It doesn't dissipate. It does not disappear. It does not die out. That, that same victory, it can, we can experience it as well. In Ephesians 1, verses 19 through 20, and the Bible says, And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe? And I ask you that question, what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe? What is that power that we experience through God's salvation? It says, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. That resurrection of the dead, that victory, that life, that conquering of death, it is the same victory for you and for me. We too can overcome. We too have that victory. Through Jesus Christ. This is the power of God to us word. You think about what a wonderful gift, what wonderful power that is that you and I can experience that as well. That power is for us when he conquered the grave. The proof of his power in the empty tomb is the same power that's carried through to us today. Many years ago in the Rose Bowl Parade, uh, many of y'all I'm sure watch it every year as the Rose Bowl Parade was progressing. One float, beautifully decorated, very ornate, a wonderful float. It sputtered out, and it stopped right in the middle of the parade. All the parade was backed up behind it. No one could move forward. And this one float had stopped and put it to a standstill the entire parade. It had run out of gas. There was no fuel in the tank. 
And they had to wait until somebody brought gas out to it to fill up that tank, to start it up again, to get that float moving, to make the whole parade move forward. But the funny thing is, that float was built and made and produced by the Standard Oil Company. The Standard Oil Company, with the vastness of its reservoir of, of oil and fuel that could fuel and did fuel many, many vehicles all around the world, could not fuel that one float because nobody had put the fuel in the tank. Can I tell you something? We have access to great reservoir of power, life, eternal hope for mankind. That power is for us today to receive it. It's available to us today. The power over death, that power of eternal life, a forgiveness of sins and a new life. Can I tell you something? That is available to you and available to me. It is there. It's accessible through Jesus Christ. Have you received Him? Have you received that power? And as Christians, we're responsible to share that power, to share that hope. The Bible says in the book of Romans, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We have the power of God unto salvation. We have access to that power through God, through Jesus Christ. Let's make sure we understand the proof of the power of God is there in this empty tomb. The second thing we find is not just the power of God, but we find the limitless love of God is evident in the fact that that tomb was empty, in the fact that Jesus Christ was not there. It is proof of God's limitless love for us. You know what? Jesus had said again and again, He was going to rise from the dead. Can I tell you something? I value greatly those that keep their word. But the truth is, all of us, we struggle. All of us at times, we fail to fulfill our every promise with the best of intentions. We sometimes commit ourselves and we do not follow through. Can I tell you something? Great love, great love is a reflection of a fulfilled commitment, a fulfilled promise. And Jesus had told His disciples repeatedly, again and again, that He was going to die, but He was going to rise from the grave. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 21, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto His disciples how that He must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. In Matthew 16, Jesus said He'd be killed, but He would raise again, He'd be raised again the third day. In Matthew 26, in verse number 32, Jesus told His disciples there, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Again, He tells them He's going to, be, he's going to die, but He's going to rise again. In John chapter number 2, verses 19, and then we'll jump over to verse number 21. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. Jesus Christ made that promise that even though the physical form, this physical body would be destroyed, Jesus would raise it up in three days. He promised again and again and again to His disciples that although He would be crucified, although He would die, He would rise again from that grave. And He keeps His word. He keeps His promise. What a great love that is, that He fulfills His word. He fulfills His promise to us. And it's interesting, the disciples, it didn't quite click to them. They didn't quite grasp and understand all that He was telling them about His death and resurrection. And even once He's in the grave, it's still a mystery. But we know He did not forget. We know He made that promise with every intention of fulfilling His Word. Every promise of God is sure. Every promise of God will be fulfilled. We can depend and lean on the promise of God. And not only in the fulfilling of His promises, but we find that the fact that He died for us. You know what the empty tomb proves? It proves that the cross was not a mistake. It proves that the cross was not just the act of vengeful men. It proves that the cross was, was not just a, a tragic circumstance. It proves that the cross was God's plan. It was intentional. It was purposeful. And it was an act of love. The empty tomb verifies the act of love that took place on Calvary's cross. You see, it was God's plan all along that Jesus Christ would die for your sins and for mine. And we can say that, and we can say that about any sacrificial death. But here we have the proof of that love. Because Jesus rose again 
from the grave. The Bible tells us, and, and listen carefully to this in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And what great love it is that Jesus laid down his life for us. But then the verification of that is found in, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Can I tell you something? The Bible, the Bible said Jesus was going to die for you and for me. The Bible tells us that He was going to rise again the third day. This is according to the Scriptures. We have the truth here of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And I'll tell you something. This was part of God's plan. He had written it out because He loved loves us. He cares for us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son for us. And the empty tomb, it verifies and shows more than just the crucifixion. Which of course what a great act of love that was. No greater love hath any man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. What a great act of love that was when Jesus Christ went to Calvary's cross and He suffered and He died there for us. And understand the suffering of Jesus. The suffering of Jesus was more, it was more than just the physical pain, which was unimaginable, I think, to any of us here today. The lashes on his back, the crown of thorns piercing his brow, the nails there into his hands and into his feet, and the agony of hanging there on that cross for six hours. And of course, we understand uh, hanging and suspended there from your arms, you cannot breathe properly. You can inhale, but you cannot exhale. And he had to lift up and take the weight up off of his arms in order to exhale. And so every breath he would struggle and rub his raw and bleeding black back up and down that cruel cross. And you find the physical sufferings of Jesus unimaginable for you and me. But it was not just physical suffering. It is the emotional pain. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ suffered. When he saw his disciples, they all forsook him and fled. When the, his, his, one of the, the closest apostles to him, when Peter denied him three times there, he denied any knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when the, when the Roman soldiers mocked him, and, and, and they put the robe on him, and the crown of thorns on him, and, and mocked him as a king, as he hung there naked before the world, he imagined the, the emotional pain and distress of, of every possible way, the emotional and internal pain pain and distress that he endured. And on that cross, he not only suffered physically, he not only suffered mentally and emotionally, he suffered spiritually. Because on that cross, he took our sins, your sins and my sins. And the Bible says he became sin for us. He suffered and died for you and for me. You know, mankind has three parts. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. There is the physical part of us. There is the mental and emotional part of us. And then there is that spiritual part of us. All of us have three parts. And God in human form had those same three parts. That physical, that mental or emotional, and then that spiritual. And he suffered every part of his humanity, suffered and paid the price for our sins. Every part of Christ suffered on that cross. And he did that because he loved you and he loved me. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 5, verses 6 through 8, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died not for good men, not for great men. He died for sinners. He died for the lost. He died for you and I who could not save ourselves. You are never never too far gone. You are never too bad. You are never too far from God that He cannot save you through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is for you who are far from God that Jesus Christ died there on that cross. And folks, you are never too good. You are never too clean. You're never too good of a person that Jesus Christ cannot pay for your sins and did not die and suffer there for your sins. 
You see, on Calvary's cross, He died for all of us because all of us are sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there is none righteous, no, not one. Each of us, no matter how good we may be, no matter how bad we may be, our sins can be forgiven there at the cross of Jesus Christ. It is for you and for I that He died there. You're listening and watching this video today because it's Easter. Maybe because you think you have to. Maybe because you think you're supposed to. But I'll tell you something. Those ladies came to that tomb. They thought they had to. They thought they were supposed to. They came there with motives that were certainly admirable. But they came not expecting to find what they found. They came with one purpose. They came away with a great gift. Can I tell you something today? You've come here with one purpose. I don't know what that may be. But you can walk away with a great gift. And that's Jesus Christ. You can walk away with experiencing the power of God through the resurrection. You can walk away experiencing the love of God in, 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 in the fact that he, died, that he died for us and rose again the third day. You can walk away today with something greater than you expected. You can walk away today with fear of God and His awesome power and great joy because He loves you. He cares about you. He died for you. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and by that I mean, has there ever been a time in your life where you just believed you knew Jesus Christ died for your sins, He rose again the third day, and you asked Him to save you of your sins, to forgive you for your sins, and to come into your heart and, and, and to make you that new creature. Have you ever prayed and invited Jesus to be your Savior, believing that He died and rose again? If you've not done that, today is the day of salvation. Right now is the appointed time, the Bible tells us. Right now, if you believe in your heart, you can confess with your mouth and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But I'll tell you something, Christian, for us, that power of God and that love of God does not stop at the cross, it does not stop at the empty tomb. It continues on and works through us. We have today, if you're saved, if you're born again, you have a great gift. You have the power of God that secures eternal life for you. You have the proof of the love of God here, and you have it in God's Word. You have the power of salvation to everyone that believes. Would you share that love? Would you share that power? Would you walk away today with fear of God and a great joy with the love of God in your life? There's a poem that says, Some of us stay at the cross, some of us wait at the tomb, quickened and raised with Christ, yet lingering still in the gloom. Some of us bide at the Passover feast with Pentecost all unknown, the triumphs of grace in the heavenly place that our Lord has made His own. If the Christ who died had stopped at the cross, His work had been incomplete. If the Christ who was buried had stayed in the tomb, he had only known defeat. But the way of the cross never stops at the cross. And the way of the tomb leads on to victorious grace in the heavenly place where the risen Lord has gone. Can I tell you something? Your salvation does not end your walk in relationship with God. It just starts it. Can I tell you something? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ, what a wonderful gift that was, but it's just the beginning because He conquers death, hell, and the grave three days later, and He lives on through us, and He sits at the right hand of the Father right now, making intercession for us. The way of the cross does not end at the cross. The power of that empty tomb, the love of God expressed there does not stop there. It continues on. continues on through you today. Can I invite you today, accept Christ as your Lord and Savior and live for Christ in that power and in that love. Let's pray together here today. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you so much. <coughs> we thank you so much for his crucifixion, your great plan where he willingly died for our sins. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for a willing and a loving Savior. We thank you for that powerful resurrection.
that proves your plan and your power and your compassion. And I pray today for that one that's never received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Even today would be that day of salvation for them. That they would accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray for that one today, dear Heavenly Father, that maybe they're saved and they're born again, but they're not living in that power. They're not sharing that love. That they would continue on from this point forward in the love and in the power of God, exemplified in that empty tomb. And I pray today, dear Lord, we would turn from this video with great fear of you and respect for you, filled with your love and joy. And I pray that this Easter Sunday would magnify and glorify you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You have a great Easter.